Far beyond the reaches of the four rocky planets, lurking on the opposite side of the asteroid belt, we find our solar system's showpiece worlds, the two gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. As the two largest planets, both exhibit their own range of fascinating phenomena, making them tantalizing targets for space probes exploring the planetary neighborhood. But with their tremendous gravitational influences, their irradiating magnetospheres, and above all, their vast distances, reaching these worlds with a probe presents a much greater challenge than traveling to one of the terrestrials. But from the early 1970s, the technology for more resilient probes capable of longer voyages was primed, and missions to both Jupiter and Saturn ensued. And it is those missions that make up the topic of our video today. We will re-examine their revolutionary findings over the years. From snapping breathtaking shots of their upper atmospheres to revealing seismic secrets about the moons that surround them, this is our journey to the gas giant planets. The Gas Giants the gas giants are the principal planets of the solar neighborhood. Both are stunning, striking worlds with rich, extended atmospheres, each showcasing their own plethora of extreme weather processes. Any journey into their territory starts with Jupiter, the godfather planet, more than double the mass of all the other worlds combined. The clouds swirling in its atmosphere weave a vibrant tapestry of our solar system's oldest and largest planet. Saturn, on the other hand, is the solar system's crown jewel, with a smoother surface and an even greater number of moons, along with one of the most spectacular sights in space its unparalleled planetary ring system. Furthermore, both of these giants host their own collections of planet-sized moons, some with eyebrow-raising prospects for habitability. As such, missions to study the gas giants have often found themselves at the top of NASA's to-do lists, with the first Jupiter-bound mission conceived as early as 1959. However, both worlds lie significantly farther from the Sun than the planets of our local terrestrial neighborhood. The closer of the two, Jupiter, is around five times the distance separating the Sun and the Earth, while Saturn is about double that. As such, a voyage to either of these worlds would take years instead of months, and for the planets lying beyond Saturn, whole decades would be required. It didn't seem feasible for the somewhat temperamental, short-lived probes of the late 1950s, which had barely begun to escape Earth's gravity. And so, moving into the 1960s, as NASA set their sights on the bodies of the outer solar system, the scientists at their Jet Propulsion Laboratory began investigating ways to trim down this journey time, utilizing both clever engineering techniques and natural means. When Planets Align As we covered in the last episode, humanity's maiden voyages to both Venus and Mars were launched during their respective windows of closest approach i.e., when the orbits of either planet aligned them most closely with the Earth, enabling the simplest, shortest trajectories between the two. And in 1964, a study by the JPL revealed that a similar planetary alignment event between all four of the large planets would take place sometime in the late 1970s, the likes of which occurred only once every 177 years. This would present a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to visit each of the giant planets and perhaps even Pluto with spacecraft, and only a fraction of the time required otherwise, by using each stop on the way for a gravitational boost. As we touched on last time, it had long been known by scientists that when icy comets, such as the comet Halley, passed by a planet, their velocity seemed to increase on the way out as they received a gravitational assist upon exit. Applying this technique to a probe, specifically one flying by Jupiter, would induce a similar gravitational slingshot effect, which could effectively treble its speed and correct its course without the need to carry any extra fuel pruning the journey time to Neptune down from around four decades to about one and a half. As such, the JPL quickly conceived of an ambitious series of long-distance probes that would make use of this alignment by using Jupiter as a stargate to visit all five of the then-contemporary planets of the outer solar system. This project would eventually materialize as the world-famous pair of Voyager probes, but that is a story for another day. In the meantime, however, NASA sought to practice this gravitational slingshot maneuver before the Voyagers arrived, while also ticking off their now most pressing planetary targets, Jupiter and Saturn. 
And so, in 1969, they signed off on a pair of spacecraft as part of their Pioneer program, a dormant series of spin-stabilized probes which had some years earlier been used to study space weather. These missions, however, then designated Pioneer F and Pioneer G, would carry over old successful designs to create a new, more streamlined and resilient pair of probes fit for a longer interplanetary voyage, one which would take them to the outer solar system. The former, today known as Pioneer 10, would become the first probe to cross the asteroid belt and reach Jupiter before receiving a gravitational boost and ultimately shooting off into deep space. Pioneer G, on the other hand, today known as Pioneer 11, would repeat these same steps, but would use its gravitational boost to carry onto the other gas giant planet, Saturn. Hundreds of scientific experiments were proposed for these probes, and their construction was estimated to have required more than 25 million working hours. Aboard their final sets of mounted instruments were helium magnetometers, plasma probes, charged particle detectors, cosmic ray telescopes, radiation detectors, asteroid and meteorite trackers, Geiger tube telescopes, and finally optical instruments for studying invisible, ultraviolet, and infrared wavelengths. Pioneer 10's Journey to Jupiter Pioneer 10 launched from Cape Canaveral on the 2nd of March, 1972, spending about four months making its way towards the inner edge of the asteroid belt lying between Mars and Jupiter. It would enter the circumstellar fence of rocky projectiles on the 15th of July. But unlike the stuff of science fiction, its passage was smooth, barely straying within 10 million kilometers of a large object during seven months on the inside. And save for some negligible impacts with dust particles, Pioneer 10 emerged from the asteroid belt unscathed on the 15th of February in the following year, where it started to return the first heliophysics data from the space beyond the terrestrial neighborhood. It probed the solar winds and cosmic dust for their chemical constituents, while also detecting the first helium atoms from interstellar space. After clearing the asteroid belt, Pioneer 10 maintained its outwardly passage for a further nine months before eventually coming within 25 million kilometers of Jupiter and initiating its observations phase on November the 6th. In the month that followed, the probe closed in on the Godfather planet and studied its surrounding environment. In doing so, it amassed the first collection of more than 500 groundbreaking images of the giant and its iconic Great Red Spot before making its closest approach on the 3rd of December. But as the craft crossed Jupiter's magnetic equator, it was exposed to a huge electron flux, some 10,000 times stronger than the most corrosive around Earth. This wreaked havoc on the probe's instruments by generating a series of erroneous commands, which threatened to derail the mission altogether. While its engineers were able to rectify most of the troubling issues, only six of the spacecraft's 11 core instruments remained operational as they were turned back to image Jupiter's moons. As a result, an image of the moon Io, as well as some close-ups of Jupiter itself, were lost. And while the craft was able to capture two of the other moons, Europa and Ganymede, only images of the latter yielded meaningful detail. Upon starting its exit from the Jovian system on the December the 4th, Pioneer 10 became the first probe to receive a gravitational assist from another planet, catapulting the craft en route towards its final destination, interstellar space. Having accrued so much velocity from its trajectory through the Jupiter system, Pioneer 10 had now been set on an irreversible path, becoming the first man-made object to reach the solar system's escape velocity, i.e., the speed needed to overcome the gravity of the sun for the duration of the journey beyond. Covering more than half a billion kilometers a year, Pioneer 10 crossed the orbit of Saturn just three years later, in 1976, followed by the orbit of Uranus in 1979, and then Neptune's in 1983. It would continue along this path for another 15 years almost, before its vanishingly weak signal became too faint to transmit any readable data. But while the mission was officially concluded on the 31st of March, 1997, Pioneer 10 would continue to beam back the occasional featureless telemetry signal for a further six years. In fact, the very last contact with the probe was on the 23rd of January, 2003, from a distance of more than 80 astronomical units finally capping off what was originally intended as a 21-month mission.
After more than 30 years a true testament to the craft's engineering and the time that was invested in future-proofing its design. Pioneer 11's Jupiter Journey just over a year after the launch of Pioneer 10, the subsequent follow-up mission, then known as Pioneer G, was prepared to follow. Like the former, this spacecraft would float across the asteroid belt en route to the Jovian system before passing the large planet to receive a gravitational boost. But unlike its predecessor, which was slingshot straight into deep space, Pioneer 11 would carry on towards the other gas giant, becoming the first probe to visit the solar system's crown jewel, Saturn. There, it would study its atmosphere, magnetosphere, and planetary rings, as well as the many intriguing moons in orbit around the giant. And upon completion of those pre-programmed objectives, Pioneer 11 would be used to test a slingshot maneuver of its own flying through Saturn's ring plane. The probe lifted off from Cape Canaveral on the 5th of April, 1973, embarking on an 18-month voyage to Jupiter through the asteroid belt. It encountered the giant planet in November and made its closest approach a month later on the 2nd of December. It came within just 43,000 kilometers of Jupiter's cloud tops three times closer than its counterpart the year before, but it did so at a much higher velocity, resulting in less prolonged exposure to damaging radiation. As such, all of the craft's 11 instruments this time survived their encounter, snapping over 200 even sharper images of the planet including the first shots of its polar region and more of its swirly outer atmosphere. The probe also enjoyed more success in studying the Galilean moons, capturing images of Io and Callisto where Pioneer 10 was unable. Upon receiving its bespoke gravitational boost, Pioneer 11 would venture outwards for another five years before encountering its next target Saturn. Classification and was thus reassigned as the Galileo spacecraft, named in honor of the discoverer of the four large Jovian moons, Galileo Galilei. This probe consisted of both an orbiter and a detachable module that would be dropped into Jupiter's upper atmosphere. However, the technology to both develop and test this Galileo entry probe would not become available until during the 1980s. And other unforeseen factors also hampered and delayed the Galileo mission. Everything from bad weather, test failures, lawsuits targeting the probe's nuclear technology, and even the Challenger disaster led to its launch being delayed all the way through until 1989. But at last, the probe did finally lift off from Earth on the 18th of October aboard the space shuttle Atlantis, which delivered it to a low Earth orbit. It would then execute a series of engine burns and thrusts to guide it into a heliocentric orbit, where it would receive both slingshots and course corrections from flybys of the Earth and Venus. After accruing enough momentum, the probe then embarked on a long, arcing trajectory through the asteroid belt before coming within range of the Jupiter system in mid-July 1995. Almost immediately, the Galileo entry probe was released and slowly drifted towards the cloud tops alongside its orbiter. It would take another five months before the entry probe finally breached Jupiter's atmosphere on the 7th of December, traveling at around 50 kilometers per second on impact. It then spent around an hour sinking beneath the cloud's edge, plunging to a depth of more than 180 kilometers hardly scratching the surface in the grand scheme of the giant's structure, but still returning invaluable insights on the increasingly hellish conditions unfolding below. It measured chaotic wind speeds of almost 2,000 kilometers per hour, with temperatures climbing to a scorching 16,000 Kelvin before the probe's heat shield finally succumbed back in space, and the orbiter prepared to fire its engines to decelerate to achieve orbital insertion, making it the first probe to be captured by a world in the outer solar system on the 8th of December. Over the next seven years and nine months, it would make no less than 35 long laps around the Jupiter system, spending only short periods of time up close with the planet to give its instruments time to recover from exposure to radiation. Over the course of the mission, it assembled an extensive, comprehensive dataset for the Godfather planet and its surrounding environment, making astounding discoveries on both counts. It captured an active volcanic eruption on the torrid moon of Io, and on closer inspection, revealed lava flows on its surface for the first time. It also mapped Ganymede's surface in much greater detail, identifying complex magnetic field interactions around this almost Mars-sized moon. 
and on Europa, it uncovered the strongest evidence yet for a long-speculated ocean of liquid water, atop which the moon's icy crust is thought to be suspended. Upon exhausting its fuel reserves, in September 2003, the Galileo spacecraft's engines were fired for the last time, as the probe was intentionally steered into Jupiter. In order to avoid crashing on one of the moons and contaminating a potential subsurface ocean, it followed its entry probe to a crushing demise and concluded its mission on the 21st night of September, 2003. But as one door slammed shut, another swung open because the end of the Galileo mission to Jupiter coincided with the start of the first Saturn orbiting mission by the spacecraft Cassini Huygens. Titan is a planet-like moon with a dense atmosphere, unlike anything else in the solar system. As such, Titan has always been viewed as an essential component of missions exploring Saturn, with Cassini carrying out no less than 45 flybys of the moon during its initial four years of operation. The first came in October 2004, when it passed about 1,200 kilometers from the tip of Titan's clouds. Its infrared and ultraviolet instruments then began peeling back the layers of this atmosphere for the first time, compiling preliminary maps of Titan's surface with a view to identifying a suitable landing site for the Huygens probe. And on Christmas Day, 2004, Cassini's gift to Titan was sent hurtling down towards its clouds, finally penetrating their outer edge around three weeks later. It recorded and relayed its two-and-a-half-hour descent, beaming back around 350 pictures of its approach though a further 350 were lost in a software failure. But on the 14th of January, 2005, the Huygens probe touched down in Titan's Adiri region and continued to broadcast what it saw for a further 90 minutes. In that time, it captured the first and still only glimpse we have from surface of a body in the outer solar system. These images show boulders of reflective water ice, frozen as hard as rock by Titan's brutal surface temperature of minus 180 degrees Celsius. But what makes this image particularly interesting is that these boulders appear to have been smoothed by another flowing liquid, though certainly not water at this low temperature. Rather, Titan is home to a network of lakes and rivers of liquid methane, which Cassini found indisputable evidence for in 2006. In fact, Titan has a methane cycle which bears striking similarities to the water cycle on Earth. And if we were to warm Titan up, this methane would evaporate and the water ice mountain ranges would melt to take its place. Thus, in the very distant future, when the sun has swollen to red giant stature and Earth has been swallowed whole, it is Titan that may have the best hope for future awakening of life with rivers, streams, weather, and precipitation to mix up its surface-dwelling abundances of organic compounds. Enceladus Underground Ocean Another of Saturn's moons with intriguing prospects for habitability is Enceladus, though it bears a quite different set of potentially life-giving characteristics. Enceladus is smaller than Titan and lacks a substantial atmosphere for supporting life on its frozen surface. But like Jupiter's moon, Europa, Enceladus is thought to have a buried, subsurface oceanic layer, which is warmed and tidally heated by gravitational resonances in the Saturn system. These motions cause friction within the moon's interior, resulting in energetic upwellings in its liquid layer, which press against the icy surface and refreeze, creating faults, and sometimes, even causing cryovolcanic eruptions. In 2005, around two months after the Huygens probe had touched down on Titan, Cassini saw the outline of an ice geyser eruption at Enceladus' south pole as it spurted out plumes, which regularly fall into orbit along Saturn's ring system and replenish its frozen material. A few years later, and Cassini went one better, as it flew straight through one of these water-rich plumes during a flyby of Enceladus, sampling its chemical constituents, and all but confirming the presence of a tidally heated, salty liquid ocean beneath its surface. Other studies, rings and storms. With so much exciting potential seemingly locked away within these moons, it's easy to lose sight of Cassini's other studies, including its extensive analyses of Saturn's rings. Using radio signals and occultation, it determined the 3D structure, dynamics, and consistency of their constituent moonlets, identifying both fine structures and more complex, gravitationally bound clumps clearing gaps in the ring's material. The probe also studied a number of extreme weather events playing out in Saturn's upper atmosphere, starting in 2006, when a cyclone was seen near one of its poles. 
It also studied one of the planet's most jaw-dropping features, its iconic North Pole hexagon, another enormous, ice storm extending almost 30,000 kilometers, which was originally found by the Voyager spacecraft. Between 2008 and 2017, Cassini observed gradual color changes in this cloud pattern in response to seasonal changes in its exposure to sunlight. And then in 2010, it saw something visible only once every 30 years Saturn's great white spot. This storm bears resemblance to Jupiter's great red spot, but unlike the latter, it did not persist for very long or stay rooted in one place. Instead, it whipped around the face of the planet, leaving long trails of suspect white discharge in its wake, which slowly faded away over a number of years. By this time, Cassini had completed the primary phase of its mission, which lasted four years up to July 2008. But with plenty more fuel in the tank, and its battery power still well conserved, its engineers were able to extend Cassini's operational life by an additional two years. This enabled the probe to study Saturn during its Equinox event in 2009, thus coining the mission extension's title. And upon the conclusion of the Equinox phase, in June 2010, Cassini's mission was renewed again for another six and a half years, taking it all the way through to Saturn's summer solstice in 2017. This extension allowed for another 155 revolutions of Saturn, 54 of Titan, and 11 of Enceladus. But by the time these were completed, the craft really was starting to run on fumes. Cassini's Grand Finale And thus, as its ultimate act, Cassini's engineers directed it to execute its so-called Grand Finale routine, the last part of the mission, which would entail the riskiest maneuvers yet. In April 2017, Cassini's orbit guided it through a gateway in Saturn's rings, passing just 300 kilometers from the visible inner edge. It then made a further 22 orbits through this gap, enabling it to attain the closest observations yet of Saturn's atmosphere, weather, and rings. It took its final images of the giant planet in September, before being intentionally flown into Saturn, once again to avoid contaminating a potentially life-bearing moon. And there is a rumor that this breathtaking shot was Cassini's final glimpse before it plunged to its crushing demise. But alas, this is just an artist's impression often passed off as the truth on social media. In reality, Cassini's last view of Saturn was actually this much less interesting image. It then finally dropped into the gas giant's clouds on the 15th of September, 2017, bringing to a close more than a decade of revolutionary discoveries and stunning shots of the Saturn system, and it may be decades before we see another orbiter that reveals as much as the Cassini spacecraft did. The question is, what is actually on the table in the near future? Well, in recent years, missions to the gas giants have become more and more aligned with future missions to the gas giants the study of their moons, with a central focus on habitability around Europa of Jupiter and Titan of Saturn. As the closer of the two, the former has enjoyed more attention from scientists in the years since the Galileo and Cassini orbiters. In that time, we've re-established a persistent presence around Jupiter with the Juno spacecraft, the 